Good morning, afternoon or evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to The Eighth Plot, where I'm going to continue reading to you from my book, Stolen Futures. If you want to know more about the book, or the universe of the Arkonauts, go to my official website, www.mdrury.co.uk. Or if you wish to get the whole series, because you like what I read to you, head to Spaceboy Books at readspaceboy.com. Let me know what you think of today's chapter in the comments. Enjoy! Chapter 5. Our Mission First, let me outline the mission once again for you, Dr. Ghost said. I rolled my eyes. I had heard this all before back on Earth, and I doubted anything had changed, so I slumped back in my chair. The Doctor's face retreated to an insert box at the top left-hand corner of the screen, and a map of the solar system filled the rest. Each planet's orbital paths were traced across an inky blackness. Only half the planets were on the screen. As you know, the Destroyer was an automated spaceship that arrived in our solar system and was projected to leave via this course, the Doctor said. The map focused on planet Earth, whole and healthy, and showed a blue triangle leaving the planet and heading outward to the edge of the solar system. We believe it is taking the resources it stole from our world back to wherever it came from, the Doctor said. Because of this, your course will send the Ark in the opposite direction, out of the system towards a wormhole that has been orbiting our sun for millennia. I had heard of the wormhole in orientation. It was discovered using the advanced technologies harvested from the Ark. No one had ever been through the wormhole before. I suddenly wasn't sure if I wanted to traverse a gigantic space phenomenon that no one had ever experienced. The wormhole has been studied by long-range probes, and we have determined that on the other side there is a planet similar to Earth. We believe this is the best shot the human race has of settling a new home, one the destroyer won't be able to reach. That was good news. I had wondered if it was worth saving us if the destroyer was able to find us again somewhere down the line. Because of limited resources due to the destroyer's harvesting, the water and oxygen that is on board the Ark will last four years. We've calculated that your journey to the wormhole will take a year, your journey through it a single day, and your trip to the nearest habitable planet on the other side another year and a half. You will have a year and a half's backup supply with you on your journey. This has been calculated for the exact number of passengers you have. No more, no less. <laughs> Where would new passengers come from anyway? I didn't think we were allowed to pick up hitchhikers. Over the course of the next two plus years, you must tend to the vessel and prepare yourselves to begin a colony on your new homeworld, the Doctor explained. Now then, the time has come for you to learn each other's names. For security, we never allowed you to socialise on Earth. However, you are now crewmates, and when you reach the planet on the other side of the wormhole, hopefully you'll be the beginnings of a new human race. I knew it! I knew it! A flipping icebreaker, I thought. I shrank further down in my seat. This presentation will now cycle through all your names and photographs. Use the memory techniques implanted by Howard Carver to commit each of them to memory. I sat up straight. This was better. Howard Carver was the fourth memory implant we were given. He had been a celebrated memory man, able to commit vast stores of information to near perfect memory. All of us had his various techniques and ways of thinking in our minds. In fact, our brains had even been partially reorganised in order to replicate his unique mind. We learned all of Carver's techniques through a variety of injections administered over the course of the last nine months. However, it wasn't chemicals or medicines that changed our minds. It was something far more invasive. It was millions of nanites. Small robots the size of germs that are able to work on a cellular level to alter our bodies, and they were in each injection. They literally tore apart the tiniest pieces of our bodies and rebuilt them to accommodate the new techniques and memories. Some also had latched onto my very flesh and physically expanded my brain. In my head right now, small robots that looked like insects were crawling all over my brain. Have you ever sat around the campfire and swapped horror stories? Well, I have. And the most frequently repeated one was about earwigs, how they crawl into your ear and lay their eggs inside. Well, that's how I feel every day. The feeling of something crawling around inside my head is like nothing else. In total, we had 17 memory implants in our minds. 
The process of programming them was very complex. The batch of nanites would first be injected into another human, one whose mind you wish to replicate. For example, Howard Carver was injected, and the nanites were programmed to seek his brain and copy the parts needed to transfer the ability to memorise facts. I guess we could have just been taught his methods, but it was too dangerous to risk one of us forgetting. Once the nanites copied his mind, they were extracted and re-injected into each of us. Carter had to do this almost 260 times, for 260 injections. I can't imagine what it was like for him, and the other 16 people who donated their talents to us all. Receiving these new skills had been the most difficult and interesting part of the whole orientation process. However, their full potential wasn't activated until now. Dr. Ghost didn't want our personalities to shift too dramatically while on Earth. Maybe for security, or maybe just so our families didn't see us change. The first memory implant was the reason I was no longer capable of crying or getting angry to, a, you know, the way a teenager would. Even before it was fully activated, it had given my mind enormous discipline I shouldn't have at the age of 15. Implant number one had belonged to a Captain Amos, a Royal Marine who had served across the globe and had even entered the destroyer on a mission to destroy it from within. It was a failed mission, but the captain made it out alive. His memory implant imparted his sense of duty and confidence in a war zone, his courage in the face of perhaps the most terrifying place for a human to visit. This was a man who kept fighting even when his fellow soldiers died around him in a frenzy of bullets. Amos's unflappability was keeping me from having a breakdown right now. As the doctor said, the screen showed the names and faces of my fellow crewmates, in alphabetical order, sorted by country of origin. The first picture was of a boy. His name was Dequan and he was from Afghanistan. The picture was like a passport photo. The boy wore the most neutral expression I'd ever seen on a human being, and it was then that I realised mine would bear the same expression too. We probably all had the same photographer at some point, telling us how to hold ourselves and where to look and not to say cheese. As I focused on the name and details about the Quan, I saw people who were probably seated next to him, turning their heads to check him out in the flesh to confirm it was him. The next picture was a girl, and the one after that, a boy, and I wondered if that was deliberate. No doubt there needed to be an equal boy-to-girl ratio, I guess. I also thought that whoever had selected us was lazy, as he had simply gone boy-girl, 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 according to country. If my luck had been different, if I had been a girl, maybe I wouldn't have been chosen. Maybe I would have been left behind. The thought made me uncomfortable. The sequence of names and faces continued. My name and face finally appeared, and I read the details. Callum Tusker, born in England. I was happy with the photo. It showed me at the age of 13 with longer hair than I had now. The army base barber was no kind of stylist, and it wasn't like soldiers could request the latest hairstyle. I also had more weight to my face then, not the ration-made bony features I had now. I admired my hair. It was black and curly and framed my face. Also, the scar wasn't there. It was not yet passing vertically across my left eye from my forehead to just above my mouth. I hated that scar, another wound brought about by my selection. Everyone in the cinema turned to me when my picture came up. Many looked at me, then the picture, then me again. The absence of a scar on the picture obviously confused them. I knew I was going to get a lot of questions about that later. When the next picture came up, attention returned to the screen once more. I watched 258 faces appear and disappear, and I had them all committed to memory by the time the last face disappeared. Knowing all their names and faces didn't prompt me to go and talk to any of them, though. The last face faded from view, and fading into his dominating position in the centre of the screen was Dr. Ghost. Now then, children, I think it's time for you to rest and relax for the next 12 hours. No doubt your day has been exceptionally trying and emotional. The whole arc is open to you except the cargo bays, which you will gain access to in a couple of days. If you want to sleep, you can find your designated apartments using the computer terminals around the ship. Service robots are already performing maintenance duties, so do not be alarmed if you meet them. Dinner will be served at 8pm in the cafeteria. Just follow the illuminated line when it's time. Tomorrow, you will meet your mission leader, who will command the Ark. Rest well. The Doctor's face was lost to blackness as the screen powered down and the cinema became quiet. Mission leader? I didn't know there was going to be one. I guess the governments couldn't really trust 200 plus children to manage themselves. In some ways, I was glad an adult was going to take charge tomorrow. I had always been the type to step up and lead in school, on sports teams. But I hate being one of these people. 
I hate the responsibility and conflict when someone else decides and they would have done it better. Faces turned towards me from all around the cinema. I sensed that they were already looking to me, probably because I was the first to follow the red line. No one was getting out of their seats or talking. After seeing all those names and faces, our names and faces, knowing that we were all that was left of Earth, that Jack and Mum and Dad weren't on that screen, I just wanted to be alone. I got up and ascended the stairs to the exit, keeping my eyes fixed on the steps, and not once looking into the eyes that followed me. I knew the arc was huge and there was plenty to explore, and there was plenty on my mind that I still wanted to forget. Without thinking, I turned left when I exited and started walking. I started to run when I heard footfalls following me. I just wanted to be alone. Thank you for listening to this chapter from Stolen Futures. Please like or comment on this video and subscribe to The Ape Plot so you don't miss out on the next instalment of this book. Goodbye.